So Paul, we just saw that we're kind of in the middle of this pancake squashed uh, clump of stars. But where are we in that long bit wise? Because you showed it was a lot more this way than this way. So where are we? Yeah, so if you look at the entire sky, now this is a map of the whole sky. Now the sky, of course, is a sphere all around yep. us. What we've done here is you project it onto a map like a globe of the Earth. Okay, yep. And what you can see is the Milky Way along the middle, yep. and the Milky Way goes all the way around the sky. So if it actually was a sphere, it's like a, a ring all the way around. So we go all the way around the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, kind of convecting this, kind of like we're this big donut almost. Yeah, you can never see all of it on Earth at one time, but if you were floating in space far from a planet, you could actually look all all the way around and see it as a ring all the way around oh. you. And what you can see is there's one patch of the Milky Way which looks a bit brighter and a bit thicker. This yeah. is actually down in the constellation of Sagittarius, which is a little bit in the Southern Hemisphere. Yep. Milky Way is definitely better in the Southern Hemisphere it than is, the North. It definitely is. I guess we're both Northern Hemisphere people <laughs> who move south purely to see the Milky Way better. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and um, but nonetheless, the Milky Way goes all the way around. It's in the north and south. Yep. And if you actually point a telescope at different places along here, you count roughly the same number of stars per unit area in the north and the south and everywhere else. So there's no real differences depending on where you are when you're looking at this very concentrated disk. So this was first worked out by the uh, British astronomer and composer William yep. Herschel. His symphonies are actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, people were very broad those days. That's right. It, the, the Renaissance person is really an apt term for these people sometimes. Yeah, and what he did was he mapped the Milky Way in different places in the north and south. He actually went down to the southern hemisphere and did some mapping yep. from, I think it was in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And what he counted the number of stars, he assumed the more stars you see, the further the disk goes. And so what he decided was that we were actually maybe not quite in the middle. Yep. There were slightly more stars in the southern direction than the northern direction. But nonetheless, it was roughly the same. So we thought we were roughly in the middle of this disk, which he thought was maybe uh, a thousand light years okay. sideways and a few hundred light years vertically. And he had these two B bars over here because there were fewer stars in the middle. Yep. And so this was his idea. He called it like an island universe. Oh, that's right. And so, because at this time, we also didn't know that there were really anything else, that the stars all just looked like stars. We didn't see any other detail, any other potential fuzziness or something that could have alluded us to that there was nothing else Well, you there. did see fuzzy things which we now know are other That's galaxies, right. but they didn't know what they were at exactly. that time, and in fact, for hundreds of years later. So... That's what you get if you count stars in the visible light, which was the only thing available to William Herschel back yes. in the 1700s. But if you use infrared astronomy, yep. or radio astronomy, or X-ray astronomy, these are wavelengths that can see through dust. If we go back to the visible here, you can see these dark bits. And those are not places where there are gaps in the Milky Way. Those are just dust clouds hiding the stars that are still there behind them. Mm. And in fact, this is what we talk, uh, they talk a bit about in the uh, Aboriginal astronomy unit of this, using these dark constellations as structure of the galaxy. But all these other colors can see through this yeah. dust. So the last image was an optical one taken by the Gaia satellite. Now we've got an infrared one taken by the two micron all sky service. This is working at a wavelength of two microns, okay. which is near infrared. Yep. And that means it penetrates dust to some extent. Okay. So this dust is tiny grains, it's more like smoke actually, it's mm. tiny grains of particles floating in space and it's a curse of many people's lives. Pretty much yes. Um, and now but if, but the infrared we can see through it partially and now we see there's really a big concentration of stars in the middle in the Sagittarius and yep. Southern Hemisphere and definitely much fewer further out. Okay. So it, become, it became clear from these sort of measurements that were actually in, that Milky Way was much bigger than Herschel thought. Yes. It would, no matter which direction he looked, even the directions that didn't appear to have dust, they actually did have dust, it was just further away behind uh, large yeah, numbers yeah. of so stars. So you couldn't really even see that, yeah. So what he'd mapped very accurately is the bit you can see in visible light, but that's only a small fraction of the total as we now call it, the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Yep. And so with infrared astronomy, you can see all of it. Yep. And it turns out it's a, a disk. So it's a, something like this. It's very flattened. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like a LP record or a CD, if you can remember things like that, or a Frisbee or something <laughs> We're like that. We're getting into this. archaeology almost here, Paul. <laughs> That's right. With a concentration of stars in the middle and then the very thin disk going outwards. Okay. 
And so there's still not that many as we go to the top and bottom, still really concentrated in that middle part of the disc. That's right. And where is the sun? Well, we're actually in the outskirts. We're about 26,000 light years away from the middle. So we are decently far away from the middle, but we're not at the edge. Not at the edge. We're maybe you know, half or two thirds okay. of the way out. It's not got a very definite edge, so you can't see exactly where it ends. It just gets fewer okay. and fewer stars. Vertically, we're almost exactly in the middle. Okay. And that's just a coincidence. Our star is actually moving up and down. And just so happens that at the moment, we're relatively we're in, in the middle. middle. But you know, another few million years time, we'll be further up or further down. Well, do we move in and out then? <laughs> we do as well, but not by very much. Okay. So we're always going to be tens of thousands of light years out from the center. And we're always going to be within 50 or 100 light years of the middle. Okay. So we live on the outskirts of the flattened disk structure of a galaxy, the Milky Way. Here's a fly through of it. Um, so this is giving us an impression of what it would like to actually fly in from the outside. So you can see over here yeah. the middle of the galaxy where it's thicker, but you can see the very thin thing. And as we fly into that thin disk, you can see what looks like a Milky Way looking along it. That's right. Broken up by dust clouds and the very large numbers of stars. And as we go above or below, we would see fewer and fewer of these things. So, so our view of the Milky Way would change from the Earth if we were to be further up or further down or further out or further in. So if we weren't in the middle, if, if this was our our galaxy and we were up here, instead of having a Milky Way, we'd see a big disk in one side yep. of the sky. The fact that we see it as a line around the sky is because we're right in the mid-plane. Okay. We see it going all the way around. 